applicable and where civil action has to step in to uh, to fill in the gaps with uh, between what the government the, the services that the government provides. Uh, and so uh, thank you again, everybody. And I'm going to introduce the uh, the speakers here in, in order. Uh, so uh, to start with, Dr. Yvonne Santiago is my mm -hmm. colleague in civil engineering, and she serves as the co-director of the Aspire Engineering Research Center and, an associate, and is an associate professor in civil engineering. Throughout her career, Dr. Santiago has been the recipient, recipient of numerous prestigious awards. You can shorten that. Okay. 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 It. <laughs> okay. Um, and and has uh, received numerous awards and has and held numerous positions um, in the in public service, including uh, uh, on the public service board of El Paso, uh, which manages El Paso. Uh, and uh, then uh, Dr. Jeannie Concha is an associate professor in the U.S. Department of Health Sciences. Uh, she is a psychosocial behavioral scientist who uses asset-based and culturally sensitive approaches to engage Hispanic populations in health prevention and management behaviors. Her primary focus is diabetes and disparities in Hispanic populations, where she currently directs the diabetes garage. Dr. Concha has also used health behavioral theories to identify uh, asset-based strategies for engaging underserved populations and understanding the benefits of point of use water filtration systems. Her work with Dr. Santiago includes identifying cultural factors associated with using point of use water filtration systems in the colonias in El Paso. Uh, and then, uh, so I should make it clear that Dr. Santiago and Dr. Concha and then Charlie Murray are all part of one group is going to present today. And so the third presenter in, this, in our first topic uh, is uh, Charlene Lurick. And uh, Charlene founded Texas Water Trade in 2018, bringing a decade of experience in sustainable water finance. And collaborators at UTEP in the community with like neighborhood associations and policymakers. So I want to get UTEP involved with all other stakeholder groups. Right. So, yeah. And what kind of water data were you? Uh, uh, scary. So, we have 40 years worth of water left. Um, it's pretty salty water. It doesn't replenish. We have more days over 100 degrees. The Rio Grande is rang up earlier every year. And so we need to find other ways to manage our water. But it's hopeful, too. We have a strategy. Just need all your help. Have you ever seen the Zoom? Yes. Sorry. Oh, 40. Uh, well, so we rely, we'll show the data here, but we have um, three sources of our water. We have aquifers. We have two aquifers, one beneath us, one towards our west near Las Cruces, and we have the Rio Grande. Half our water comes from the aquifer beneath us. Um, this is very, very deep. So whenever it rains, it doesn't replenish. It's so deep and it's very salty. It's a fossil aquifer. And so as we draw water closer to 40 years, it gets saltier and we need to desalinate it. It takes energy. And we cannot use that water to water plants. It's too salty for plants. Um, so as we drain this water, that's it. It won't replenish. And we have the Rio Grande, but again, that's drying up earlier every year. So the question is, what do we do? So to do that, the first step is, how do we use water? Where do we use water the most? And we'll show that graph really nicely. Um, the graphs are pretty. It's very visual. We can go through it really fast. And we'll be talking, talking about urban planning. So once we have the water data, we'll run through it. We'll look at um, how do we use water? Then how do we use urban planning to address the biggest water users in El Paso. And last, collaboration. How can we all work together, the community, uh, policymakers, experts at UTEP, and also builders, developers, farmers, industry, uh, to save water, to really draw this out um, past 40 years, ideally. So. 
almost done. I'm just talking about Bob. Oh, nice. Like Murphy's Law. Like, All right. It's like, it's crap today. So. Yeah, it's pretty big there. There you go. You can also just go to waterweavers.org and we'll just open it like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is where you all are at right now. There we go. Do you have a little clicker I can use? I'll have to hit one. Okay. I can just do the buttons. It's all good. Why don't you work on Zoom while he goes through his slides? Okay. Oh. So anybody following along online? Cool. So how can we save water in El Paso? So we're going to look at three things. Water use to see where we use the water. Uh, urban planning to see how we can actually affect the biggest water users. And then collaboration to see who can do what. And everybody here can do something, which is very positive. I'm going to try to get positive, very hopeful. Next slide. Uh, so El Paso has 40 years left of water. And again, half of water comes from the aquifer. Yes. Can I say something? No. Absolutely. It's just, it's just that I, I see those numbers and they're very scary. Yeah. But, 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 you know, I think that you need to go back to um, the measures that have taken place because absolutely the, uh, the latest data from Texas Water Development Board doesn't say 40 years. So what we have is uh, for example, the water consumption per capita, mm -hmm. which I think you show at 200 and something, it has gone down to 130. Right. So it's 140, 130, but per household use is about 86. Yes. So that includes um, yes. other things besides so the water. Yeah. Is that there's reinjection of the aquifer that yeah. has been replenished. So in the last seven years, the, the level of groundwater yeah. has stabilized. Absolutely. So it's based on data from last year. This is latest research. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, I, we're going to keep it hopeful. Though, yeah, okay. I swear. Okay. <laughs> so, looking at a map. Can you just put the slides up and let's not worry about the same water. So, Rio Grande, we have the aquifers beneath us. Um, again, climate change is getting really bad. We have, on average, 16 days above 100 every year. Last year, we had 70, 7 0. So this is a big stress on the Rio Grande. It's a big stress on farms, big stress on uh, plants. What slide are you? Oh, perfect. Just get into so uh, back to the very beginning. We're on slide number four. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you do full screen in the corner? And then I'll um, press the arrows. Perfect. No. Does it reach over here or no? It's all good. We'll just keep it there. All right. I want it to fall. Okay. So how much water does El Paso use every day? Oh, please, yeah. And do the lights dim at all or no? Just a little bit so you can see. So El Paso uses 249 million gallons per day. Um, how much is that? Can you go next slide? Here's an image of UTEP. This is a UTEP library for size reference. <laughs> and next slide, please. This is a cube of water, 329 feet tall. We use this much water every day. So next question is, how do we use it? Next slide, please. Next slide. 2% is miscellaneous. That's power plants, that's industry, that is livestock. 2%, very small amount. Next slide, please. 18% is indoor. This is showers, this is your bathroom, your laundry room, your kitchen. Next slide. 26% of our water is used on landscaping. So this is more than we use for our homes, more than we use for power plants, livestock, and industry combined. Now the last segment, not yet. Maybe you want to guess what this last segment is, where our water goes, over half our water. You get one guess. Agriculture. Agriculture. Next slide, please. Oh, you cheated. Anybody else want to guess? Next slide, please. Agriculture uses 
more water than everything else combines. So uh, the question is, if you want to save water in El Paso, we need to address our two biggest water uses, landscaping and agriculture. Next slide, please. So what do we grow? We have 29,000 acres of farmland in El Paso. This is about 5% of our total area. Um, we grow pecans, we grow cotton, we grow other. Other is fruits and berries, wheat, alfalfa, and 1% vegetables. 1% of our land is used to grow vegetables, about 250 acres. So pecans require a lot of water, 200 gallons of water per day. So remember, per capita, household use indoors is about 86 gallons of water per day. Awesome. Uh, I'm afraid to press it. <laughs> okay. Oh, nice. So, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, so, pecan trees require a lot of water. We're growing a lot of pecans. It worked. Uh, what's profitable? Let's look at water use and land use. We can use the same amount of water to grow a dollar's worth of vegetables or 52 cents worth of pecans. 28 cents worth of alfalfa, uh, cotton, 23 cents worth of alfalfa. So if we want to use water profitably, we should be growing vegetables. Let's look at land. We can use land, the same amount of land, to grow a dollar's worth of vegetables, 36 cents worth of pecans, 18 cents worth of cotton, or 9 cents worth of alfalfa. Alfalfa is fed to cows. Um, so now let's look at landscaping. What should we use for landscaping? Native plants. They provide shade. They provide food. Check out buildbackwetter.org. They are medicinal. They do require no irrigation. Where can we landscape? Everywhere. These are pictures of Tucson. Your streets are covered in native plants. Parks are covered in native plants. Homes. They provide a lot of shade. It's very cool. They require no irrigation. Has anyone been to Tucson lately? Yeah. Is it wonderful? Yeah. So native plants don't need irrigation. Here's how we can actually just change how we design streets. All rainwater is diverted into native plant landscapes. Curbs, we have curb cuts, curb cuts. They're called swales. They divert rainwater into yards to grow native plants. You don't need irrigation, but if you want to, it requires a very minimal irrigation. So water use review, landscaping and agriculture use 80% of our water. Your, uh, growing vegetables is profitable and it's very efficient. Native plants require minimal irrigation if you don't want to change the streets, minimal. So the question is how do we transform landscaping and agriculture, our two biggest water users? One answer is urban planning. So how can urban planning save water? Well, by recommending policies and city ordinances to require native plant landscaping to encourage water efficient urban farming instead of pecans, alfalfa, cotton. So pretty heavy question, how do we do this? Good news, we did it 12 years ago. This is a 2012 master plan for El Paso. It's a 700 page guiding document. It has recommendations for city ordinances it has recommendations for uh, future land use in El Paso. It was created with the help of the community, a dozen consultants hired from around the country, and city planners at the city. It has water goals in addition to other goals for air quality, for transportation, uh, promote native plant landscapes, preserve nature and farmland, and promote water efficient urban farming. It has everything we need. So one example, Instead of developing this farmland in the Upper Valley or Lower Valley and putting the typical suburban housing, create walkable villages. This is from the plan. It says we need to preserve farmland by building on half of it. And this is decreases sprawl, increases walkability, and this uses land and water wisely to grow food. Now, who's seen this in El Paso? Who would like to see this in El Paso? Oh. So why hasn't this been implemented? A few reasons, lack of enforcement by policymakers. 
they're not actually passing the city ordinances. One example, 2012, they recommended uh, rainwater harvesting ordinances. It wasn't passed until last year. Um, lack of engagement by the community and experts. I wanna say at the right venues and the right times. The community is involved in the early stages, but they don't make sure it's enforced. So in the past six months alone, for example, 250 acres of farmland in the lower valley have been rezoned for warehouses. If we had used that to grow food, that would have doubled our food production in El Paso. But now it's covered with concrete, covered with asphalt, retaining heat, causing air pollution, near neighborhoods. So to quickly go over the urban planning process, these are the stakeholders. And it goes from left to right. The community works with experts, which are consultants from out of town. Experts work with policymakers. Policymakers work with builders. It's very segmented. Uh, here's a closer look at those categories of stakeholders. The question is, where do you fit? If you're a student, if you're part of a neighborhood association, a professor, a researcher, um, a builder, everybody is required. So policymakers, city council, and the city plan commission. Anybody know what the city plan commission is? No? Me neither. I was appointed last year. I've been on there for a year. There's nine people. They're appointed by the city, unpaid. And I'll show you how this integrates with everything. And here is how, well, the question now is how do builders evade Plan El Paso? Why don't we have walkable villages? Why don't we have native plants everywhere? The community informs experts. Experts guide policymakers. Policymakers direct builders. Builders can evade the policy set by policymakers just by asking not to do it. Hey, we don't want to use a farmland this way. Can you change this so, to industrial so we can put warehouses? The city says yes all the time. So rounding out, where does UTEP fit in? UTEP is an expert. At all the meetings that I've gone to with the city community groups, UTEP is absent. But UTEP is vital to this process. UTEP can empower the community, study what the needs are at the community. They can engage policymakers, keep them accountable, make things transparent, and they can elevate builders. How do we build better? How do we use land better? How do we save water? How do we uh, paint rooftops of whites? How do we make this into city ordinances? So my question here is how do you wanna collaborate? These are projects I'm working on. So empower the community. I'm designing st uh, stakeholder guide guidebooks to distribute to community groups, to researchers, uh, to policymakers, and to builders to put this data. Uh, engage policymakers. I'm using AI to analyze final pass implementation at all the city plan commission meetings for the past 12 years. They meet every two weeks. That is 6,000 items they've reviewed. And, oops. The last one was what? Elevate builders. So how does um, how can we actually get builders to implement native plants on their own? How can we get builders to address resident concerns without going through the master plan, without going through city ordinance? Connect the community to builders. And so I'm looking for collaborators. I have cards. I'll pass them out. I'll be coming to UTEP to speak to more professors, more researchers. Thank you very much for your time.